This is very exciting. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is it too loud? Is it too quiet? Um, yeah, so I'm reading from uh, my memoir, Reading Through Broken. And I'm going to start at the beginning. Ever since I could read, I read obituaries in the local paper with the name Irma Gladstone, age 89, and 50 word column survived by her sons, John and William. I sought the story of a life. I rarely got it. The photo was grainy, depicting yet another elderly white woman who, like my grandmother and great grandmother, had worn curlers in her hair. Services would be on Saturday. In lieu of flowers, we were asked to donate to a cause in her name. I seldom knew how they died, but I wanted to know how they had lived. <coughs> sometimes the men had fought in World War II, sometimes the women had served as nurses. Sometimes they were younger, too young. I knew enough to gasp when the number to the right of the name was 45 or even 57. They were often victims of car accidents, as were the children who infrequently made the pages. Sometimes the columns included an excerpt from a poem, the elementary understanding of a poem and that it rhymed and was memorable, even if the poet was not. There was the anonymous, do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep. Or Henry Scott Holland's, death is nothing at all. I have only slipped away into the next room. Even then, I knew their earnest simplicity somehow failed to express anything at all. Obituaries weren't all I read. There was A1, the comics, and the crime section. My dad taught me to read with our paper, encouraged me, encouraging me to circle A and the and any other short words I recognized as we sat on the crimson couch in our living room. The scattered light of Saturday afternoons sifting through the rubber plants in our makeshift greenhouse. My first memory is of my dad standing over me, singing me asleep in my crib, the dark around us, his voice my entire universe. Swing low, sweet chariot, he sang. Coming for to carry me home, he sang. From his somber tone, I understood that home was mixed up with tragedy. I realize this sounds preposterous, that I can recall anything from the age of two, and yet there it is nonetheless, seared into memory or imagination or a blend of the two. Growing up, every wish, blowing out birthday candles, throwing pennies into fountains, was that my grandparents, my dad, my mom, my sisters, and my dog, Condra, would live forever. I kept it a secret so it would come true. Around the time of my parents' divorce, my wish changed to dying first. Every sign of aging tripped a new wire. My grandparents' wrinkles, my dad's thinning hair. When my dad started balding, I teared up every time I saw the back of his head. I turned the potential for loss into a mathematical certainty. Each missing hair brought him one step closer to death. Despite his excellent health, I have been grieving his eventual passing since I was a child. Irrational, over the top, intense. All things I have been called fit here too. I no longer pick up that worry stone, but it's always there, waiting. I didn't get my wish. After learning to avoid my grandfather in childhood, aging made him docile and his illness even more so turning him into a happy Santa toward the end. But I no longer wished to die young. In college, I tasted my own ignorance and stepped back, changed. Haunted. 10 years later, I still can't let go. My brief moments with Maggie and Nina are fragments of film loaded through reels of imagination, awaiting stimuli to turn the dial initiate the projector's hum. Sometimes it's as simple as smelling autumn's crisp descent, or as obvious as another school shooting. 
In the silent movie that follows, I watch myself pass Nina from the dorm's narrow hallways. I smile, see his nod in return. Then there's Maggie, scowling from the corner of her room after I mistakenly mouth Margaret. Maybe this time, when the images roll forward, I'll see something in the background, an indication of what was to come. Maybe this time, I'll tap Maggie's shoulder as she leaves the dorm that Sunday and say, no, not tonight. Maybe this time, maybe this. In my waking dreams, their burden has become my burden. I need to explain his heartache, his agony. I need to explain her unwillingness to walk away. This is my apology to each of them, to myself, to that night, to our subsequent unraveling. Despite my supposed position of leadership as a resident assistant, I knew and did nothing and saved no one. Most of all, this is for me, for the girl I once was. This is the rescue mission, the searchlights, the dogs. This is the scrap heap, the forge, the beads of iron pooling into shape. What I know about them comes from what I knew then, from what Maggie's mother has told me, from what other students remember, from newspaper articles, from Maggie's memorial website, from Nina's suicide note, from 50 pages of instant messages Maggie and Nina typed to each other, included in the police report, case number 99-33575. <coughs> what I don't know, I fill in with my imagination. It's all I have and it's all I want to have. What happened does not trump my perception of what happened. This is not a tribute to the real Maggie and Nina. It cannot be but an homage to the space they have occupied in my mind. The psychic weight burgeoning ever since the immediacy of their absence. How they actually met, or why they fell for each other, or whether it was ever true love, does not concern me. What matters here is the shaping of clouds, the coloring in of ghosts, the light cast over shadows, my compulsion to tell this story because the clouds, ghosts, and shadows were mine to begin with. Four days prior to the freshman's arrival, what I playfully called Showdown 99, all of the resident assistants spent the day at our director Vaughn's beach house in Lake Michigan. We barbecued, buried each other in the sand, basted our bodies in the sun, and slid down the dunes. The shore became our playground only for a few hours. There, in the happy chaos, one of the boys snapped away, his disposable camera click, click, clicking. Instead of stealing our souls, it held them in a freeze frame. Four girls grinning, the maple's incomplete shade modeling our skin, our arms wrapped around each other despite our mostly nude bodies. There's me in the middle, my smile fading, my eyes squinting. Miniature silver hoops with a single blue bead catch the light, as does my wet, slicked back hair. I wear a turquoise two-piece, an extra, extra small stretch to the limit, my body growing up and pushing out. There's Kirsten to my right, mid-cackle, her short hair sticking up straight, her body twisted in laughter's convulsions. To my left is Amy, whose head barely tops my shoulders. Her chin-length hair matches her coal-colored eyes, closed beneath her glasses. At the far end is Julene, whose copper eyes shimmer in a splotch of sun. Just back from Senegal and older than us by two years, she was an adult standing on the edge of our teenage precipice. Someone said smile. We did. Snap. There we were, and the photograph, the slice, the snippet, the wish, the was, the instant bathed in a chemical wash, purified, pressed onto paper, hung and dried, holding within it the muted heat of a Michigan summer slowly ending. I wish I could speak to the girls in the photo to say, wait, be careful, stick together. You can't do this alone. But that photo and the moment captured within it are gone destroyed, existing only in memory, 
just like the girls who are in it. Thank you. Yeah.